It's not just about the honey. About one third of all the food we eat requires bees for pollination. So if you like to eat apples, tomatoes, squash, cucumbers, you can thank these guys. Jen Keller is a bee researcher at NC State. She studies genetics and diseases. That's a queen, that's a worker. Honeybees are in decline, have been for the last several years. Bees face a lot of challenges these days. Colony collapse disorder can wipe out whole hives, plus parasitic mites and viruses, and a big one, loss of habitat. Because of housing developments or agriculture as well, as clearing out, you don't have the small fields anymore where you would have buffers of plants. That's why lawmakers filed the Birds and Bees Bill to help pollinators. Senator Andrew Brock says studies show more beehives means better crops. With agriculture being our number one business, we've got to make sure that we continue to grow, 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 because we've got to grow a lot more food for people, not just here in the state, but across the world. Some cities and counties ban beehives outright or allow only one or two per property. The bill would allow up to five hives per property statewide. Keller thinks that could help. Instead of having one person having 20 hives in one spot, if you have 20 people with one hive spread out, you might conquer more that way. Living next door to a beehive might make some people nervous, Keller says, but it shouldn't. You, you probably would not know a hive was there unless you actually walked over and saw the bees coming and going. They're, they really are, they do their own thing and they don't care about us. They shouldn't be, you shouldn't be scared of them. If you want a taste of small town southern life, head to Salem Street in downtown Apex. Shops, offices, and restaurants line these few blocks in the heart of town. Carol Neighbor says there's a good reason it's called the peak of good living. It's very nice for families. Um, there's a warm feel to it. Money Magazine agrees. It looked at U.S. towns with populations between 10,000 and 50,000, considering everything from affordable housing to crime rates. An editor said Apex is the nation's best place to live. Apex is no stranger to Money Magazine's Best Places to Live list. In the past several years, it's gone from 15th to 14th to 9th and now number one. Town officials say they weren't expecting this. It's a great way to start a Monday. Town manager Bruce Radford tells me they knew the magazine was considering Apex, but they had no idea it would top the list. 42,000 people live here. Radford says Monday's news will bring even more. He says the town is ready. We strive every day to retain that small town character. We think that the kinds of planning that we do uh, ensures the, a great quality of life for a place that's even larger than we are today. The Chamber of Commerce's executive director told me her office already hears from a lot of folks wanting to know more about Apex. We get excited every day when folks come in from around the country and finding out why they want to come to Apex. And a lot of it is because of everything Money Magazine said. Neighbor says she'll gladly welcome more neighbors as the nation finds out what kind of town Apex is. Great place to live and a great place to work as well. Brian Schrader, WRL News, Apex. A river still runs through it, but now so does a dusty road. The cypress trees still stand, but they're no longer mirrored in still water. <laughs> to see the once picturesque Rhodes Mill Pond like this, Myra Baker feels an emptiness. When you look out there now, what do you see? Well, I still see the beautiful, pristine nature, but I see a lot of it gone. Gone since June 2013, during a tropical storm. That's when flood water swept over the dam onto the highway. The Wildlife Resources Commission drained the pond to prevent further damage to the dam. That's what was the point of keeping it drained and killing off wildlife. But wildlife officials say they had no choice. The State Division of Dam Safety ordered them to keep the lake empty, and they had the notice to prove it. The notice deemed the dam, built more than a century ago, high hazard. Eric Christofferson of Wildlife Resources says the dam's elevation has to be raised, which could flood private property upstream. And quite honestly, the dam projects are the most difficult projects that we do. And because this project affected so many other landowners, it was, it was um, difficult to thread that needle. Rebuilding dams, he says, is terribly time consuming, but he expects construction to begin in the next few months. We're very committed to um, filling that pond back up and repairing the dam like it should be. Those who love the lake are drained of patience. Myra Baker grew up on Rhodes Pond. Her family owned it before the state bought it to be preserved. I always assumed that they were about protecting wildlife in its habitat, and this is not protected. 
Wildlife officials say the boats and the bass will return. Until then, it's overrun by brush as a river runs through it. Brian Mims, WRAL News, Godwin. John Reese walked down the same driveway he's walked down for 29 years. Same neighborhood where the worst thing he recalls happening was the theft of a car radio. He stuck a check for $150 in his mailbox here along Coronado Drive. The next morning he checked his bank account. It was a $150 check had been cashed for $750. $750? Yes. I immediately called the bank and they immediately took it off of our statement. August 6th is when he put the check in the mail after the carrier had come for the day. Someone snatched the check right out of his mailbox. The check was vulnerable for uh, at least 12 hours or more. That same day on nearby Kimbrook Drive, the same thing happened at the home of Selby and Joyce Stokes. A notarized letter was swiped. Fortunately, it had no sensitive information, but a week later, it happened to them again. Flag still up, flap down, mail gone. The mail was a condolence card and a congratulations card. They figure the thief thought there might be gift cards inside. So that's it, until someone's caught, if they need to mail something, they go to the post office. But it's just frustrating when you can't use your mailbox. You know, now I'm not going to use it because I'm scared whatever I put in there is going to be taken out. Same sentiment for John Reese. Sending mail just won't be the same now. Unfortunately, uh, we're all thinking a little differently about putting, putting checks in our mailbox. Cattle rustling. Those words carry a whiff of the Old West. Think gun smoke, bonanza. We don't think of the green, green grass down home. Big money grows on all that green. Beef prices have struck a bonanza, reaching an all-time high in April. That can make a bovine bandit's mouth water. And no amount of barbed wire can tame it. J.T. Riley lives across the road from K Farms. It blew my mind because, you know, it, it takes time to get that many cattle out from over there. Ronald Kirkpatrick owns these pastures here in Southern Alamance County. We couldn't speak with him. He's in the hospital for a medical condition, but he told investigators that someone stole 199 of his top breed Angus cows, including 75 calves this spring. Says the rustler replaced them with 30 or so cheaper cows, thinking nobody would notice. So did nobody notice? I think it was Easter weekend we were out here and we seen truck truckload after truckload going in and out. Really? Yeah. And Did you think anything of it? No, because they're all the time going in, you know, doing the work over there. I wouldn't ever think somebody come out here and take this man's cattle, you know, like hey, they did. That's pretty you know? low. Yeah, it is. There is money in that cattle. Nearly $372,000, the owner says. Ronald Kirkpatrick does not live at the farm. Instead, investigators say he hires people to manage it. They told me they suspect an employee is the likely thief, someone with keys to the gates. The man from the Cattlemen's Association says rustling has happened in North Carolina, but usually it's just a couple cows here, a trailer load there. But this number, he says, is big anywhere. David and Deborah. It's another beautiful night with clear skies over the fair, the kind of night for putting on shorts and keeping your coat draped over your arm. That's how we found Chelsea Mitchell. No. You haven't even needed it yet. Nope, not at all. You think that's why so many people are here? Probably so. That good weather and these good times are bringing people out this year. And it's like herding cats. Amy McLam is steering four children through these big crowds. She had plenty of time to talk with us in the long line for the Ferris wheel. Today, I was just overwhelmed by how many people there are today. It's also been a tight squeeze all day for Yolanda Speed. Um, it's steady, real steady. She's the muscle behind countless lemonades and orange aids at the fair. But when she looks beyond her counter, she doesn't see large crowds of people. She sees something else. Money. Money? Money. <laughs> It's the sort of yell that can make your blood curdle. But then, you'll hear something that will send tingles down your spine. A pride of lions calling to one another. 
But the caretakers of these fearsome beauties fear this could all soon be silenced. This is the Conservator Center near Mebane. We do find it unbelievable that we're at risk, but if you look at the words of this bill, that is the fact. Assistant Director Julia Matson wagner is speaking of House Bill 554. It would prevent private ownership of dangerous, exotic animals. The Conservator Center is home to 80 animals, many of them, like these lions, brought here from across the country, rescued from abuse. The center staff applauds the intent of the bill. Fortunately, the way in which it has been drafted, there are many unintended consequences as a result of language issues. Such as, she says, shutting her place down. There's nothing further from the truth. This bill grandfathers current existing facilities just as long as they register with the county and agree to inspections by animal control and post signs for dangerous wild animals. Kim Album is executive director of the Humane Society in North Carolina. She says this bill isn't meant to prey on places like the Conservator Center. It's after those individuals. First responders could literally walk into a backyard in some of our counties in North Carolina and find a tiger in a, in a, in a dog pen. But those at the Conservator Center say it's the bill's language that needs taming, not their mission. <laughs> They rarely leave home without her. A black lab so sweet named Caroline. So of course Caroline was with Michael and Ruth Smith when they made a grocery run to the IGA in Irwin. Poor girl got spooked about something. When she gets scared, she'll go down the floorboard of the truck. Ruth was driving, but now she had 90 pounds of scared dog on her foot. Michael tried to pull her off. And before I could, we were wide open. We probably were going about 50, 55 miles an hour hightailing it across the parking lot. Were you terrified? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. she was screaming. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, because I didn't know what, what else to do. All she knew to do was keep the truck straight, don't hit people or cars. She aimed for a wooden fence, plowed right through it, and splashed down in a backyard pool. We hit the water, I'm going, what in the name of the God did this water come from? The pool's owner, John McNamara, was in the kitchen with his wife. There was some commotion in the yard, so he looked out and said, Honey, there's a truck in the pool. We laugh at me and say, you know, what are you, smoking or something? And I don't <laughs> smoke. <laughs> and he says, no, I mean it. Sure enough, an 88 Dodge Ram had nosedived into the shallow end. His first thought, is anyone hurt? That, and I, you know, I just had open heart surgery. <laughs> I said, I'm going to have another heart attack here. Mm -hmm. Michael Smith had some cuts on his hand. Otherwise, everyone made it out just fine. I hate that hammering to his pool. But I think it might have saved our life. But as for that dog-driven Dodge, it's done for. I mean, I don't blame her for it. You know, just one of them odd accidents that you read about in the paper or see them in the news. <laughs> I don't have any memory of it. That's the easy part for Dennis Wicker. Not so much for his wife, Elisa. She remembers the nightmare vividly, driving through Montgomery County May 9th to a wedding when the former lieutenant governor fell ill. He said, I can't breathe. He dropped the phone and he was out. He was hanging over the seatbelt and he was gray. She sped to a Troy convenience store and asked for help. Paramedics arrived and worked feverishly to restart his heart. No blood pressure, no blood pressure or anything. You were clinically dead. I was clinically dead. Emergency crews rushed Wicker to the hospital where doctors decided to cool his body to preserve his brain. He went into a coma for nearly a week. It's the most helpless feeling I have ever had in my entire life. Only 4% survived, four. So. And yet you're sitting here with us right now. I'm here today. He took the respirator out and about an hour later he said water and I jumped up and down. A day later, even better. All the neurons in his brain began to fire and he started talking non-stop. And this I remember. <laughs> After weeks of struggle with sleep deprivation, pneumonia, and trachea damage, the former lieutenant governor is now back at work as a government relations attorney. He credits his quick-thinking wife, the medical professionals, and... I'm a person of uh, deep faith, and we, you know, we have to believe that the good Lord's hand was in this. After cheating death, life is sweeter now as the Wickers near their 33rd wedding anniversary. Every extra day, a gift. I think we are now a lot more aware and sensitive to the time that we have to spend together going forward. You are not guaranteed tomorrow. We had a great summer because he lived. Do you want to play?
Alyssa Gauze makes the most of every moment with her 10-year-old son, Micah. Do you want to put a card down first? Most of those moments have been spent here, in a hospital room at Duke. He has spent almost five and a half years here. Um, this is like his second home. Micah was diagnosed with brain cancer at four and a half. His prognosis these days, not good. This newest one is growing rapidly and it's causing seizures and him to be in much more discomfort than all of the other ones have had. Last month, doctors told this single mom that there's nothing more they could do for her son. I'm honestly not sure what the next step from here is. Gauz asked about hospice care, but was surprised to learn hospice does not serve children in Wake County where they live. You would think that in Wake County, our state capital, we would have this. Diane Moore is an advocate who has been fighting for pediatric hospice care in the Triangle ever since losing her eight-year-old daughter to cancer seven years ago. My daughter was filled with a lot of fear during the last 48 hours of her life. Um, she had oxygen hunger and she was terrified. Moore says her daughter suffered because of the lack of pediatric hospice care. To go through that oxygen hunger that could have been avoided if she was given the right amount of morphine, um, I would wish she didn't have had to have gone through that. That would have been better. Pediatric hospice care is available in Greensboro, Burlington, Asheville, and Ashboro, but not in the Triangle. Why do you think more hasn't been done to provide this service in the capital city? I wish that there had been and there needs to be. Tim Rogers is the CEO and president of the Association of Home and Hospice Care of North Carolina. He says on average, less than 1% of hospice patients in North Carolina are children. I believe that the quantity of need for this service has not presented itself, but still in a society where there's one, the need is one, it's a need. Transitions Life Care, formerly known as Hospice of Wake County, will soon be the first to serve terminally ill children in the Triangle. In September, Transitions Life Care will launch its first ever pediatric hospice program, but it will have limitations. The budget will only allow for 10 patients to be served in the first year. I just wish it were available now, so I'll do that. It would leave more time for precious moments shared with Micah and less time worrying. You would think that there would be these services available to make it easy on us because at the end of life, you shouldn't have to be dealing with this. Sloan Heffernan, WRAL News, Durham.